I teach to teach so that I can entrain you to teach others. Okay, so what I would like for you to do when you come tonight, you can start tonight, bring a notebook. Be ready to take some notes because you will be teaching. If you're, if you're a believer, you will be teaching because you are to make disciples. And to be able to make a disciple, that means you have to teach. Well, the question is, what are you going to teach? And so what we're trying to do is to give you some, some tools so that you can use so that, to make disciples. Now, you all that are in pain, I want, you to, I want you to check the pain right now. I want you to check it right now. And that pain that you're in, we're going to make a scale. We're going to make a, a pain scale. Okay, we're going to start at the number 10. 10 is the pain which you are experiencing right at this moment. All right, then we are going to make this scale that's going to go down in number from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. 0 means no pain. And as we start to minister, as, we, as God starts to do something, I want you to judge that pain according to that scale. Right now it's 10, but as God starts to minister to you, realize what God is doing. But we're not going to do that yet, even though some of you might even start to receive uh, a healing now. Pain is a good indicator. Pain is something that God has enabled the body to have to let the body know there's something wrong. It's natural. It's something that God has placed in us. So when God starts to deal with the pain, you realize then that God is actually ministering to the problem for a healing to take place. So we can judge pain. Now, I know there's many people that are suffering uh, infirmities and so forth, but pain is something we can judge. We can actually see it. We can actually experience it to know if God is doing something or not doing something. You understand what I'm saying? And we'll have a time to pray for everybody in all circumstances, in all illnesses, okay? But I want you to see, I want you to see something. As Veda and I travel the world, we rub elbows with many different religions, such as Buddhism. Buddha has, Buddha has a, a, a teaching, and that teaching, people find it as a good teaching because it talks about finding peace. It talks about uh, a morality, a good moral teaching, and that's what they build their religion about, a morality, a good moral teaching. You go to India, to the Hindus, the Vedas. They also have morality in their teaching, a teaching. Go anywhere in the world, and you can find different teachings. And they all are pretty much dealing with a good morality. When we talk about the Bible, this thing keeps falling off. When we're talking about the Bible, I want to ask you a question. If I took a pair of scissors and I went page by page and I cut out from the Bible everything supernatural, every healing, every prophecy, everything that is dealing with God on a supernatural level, just removed it out, what would I have left? I would have history. And I would have teaching of good moralities, equal to Buddha, equal to Hindu. The gospel of Jesus Christ has never meant to be preached apart from signs, wonders, and miracles. Because if you take the supernatural 
out of the Bible. What you have is a good teaching, you have good history, but there's no power. And without the power of the Holy Spirit, then all it becomes is a good religion. A Christian religion. But God never meant it to be that way. God meant it to be so that we can judge that there is a God. And that He raised Jesus Christ from the, from the dead. And that there is a power in that resurrection life that we can experience right now. The majority of the church today knows a Jesus of the Bible, but they do not know the resurrected Christ. Amen. Understand what I'm saying? Because when you know the resurrected Christ, you have to understand that there's a supernatural emphasis that he places upon his word and upon the fellowship of the assembly of the saints. Every time that we are to get together, we are to have the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if we have the presence of the Holy Spirit, people, we will, we will experience a supernatural life. We will. Many times we don't experience the supernatural life because of ignorance. Ignorance is not being stupid. Stupid is not having the ability to learn. Not having the, the ability. But ignorance is having the ability to learn, but not having the opportunity to learn. Somebody hasn't taught. Somebody hasn't instructed. Somebody hasn't presented the case so that we can have faith to believe. Part of my anointing is I break strongholds. Break strongholds over the mind and break strongholds over the lives of the people. It's an anointing of the Holy Spirit. So as, as I'm speaking, I'm speaking to the guys. Now, I, I love Randy. You guys love Randy, right? He's a wonderful pastor. He is, he is, he is. I love this church. You know, if I, if I was ever to come to Texas to live, I think I'd come to Dangerfield right here. And I, I do. I love this place. I, I like you. I can feel that love. And so when I'm talking about the North American church, I'm not talking about Randy's church. I'm talking about the church in general, okay? The general church. We have to understand that there is something that God is doing. I read, I don't know what your Bible says, but I read that in the last times, it's going to get tough. I read that. That's prophecy. A tough time is coming. But I also read, on the other hand, that the glory of the later church will be greater. Amen. Greater than the first. I believe the, the Bible. I believe the Holy Spirit. I believe the way that he can proclaim something that knowing that it will do it. The Holy Spirit is in, in, in charge of making a change happen. As we look at the church today, and we look at the, what's the word? Neutered? Yeah, the neutered church of today. Meaning that a, a lot of word, but no power. And people's lives are not being affected. The people's lives are not being changed because we have written off power. And if the church in the last days is going to be more glorious than the first, what in the world has to happen? What does God have to do by His Spirit to take us from a neutered church to a powerful church that is more glorious than the first? What does He have to do? And how is He going to do that? That's the question. Is He going to do it? That's the first question I want to ask you. Is He going to do it? Do you agree with me He's going to do it? Raise your hand if you agree with me. Raise your hand. All right, so now we are saying, okay, God, you are going to do this. Now the question is, how? How 
is it going to happen? If you're walking in ignorance, is it going to happen? No. It has to be experienced. Something has got to happen. It's just not knowledge that is implanted into your mind. I'm not a very good preacher. I like to preach, but I'm not a very good preacher. But what I can do is I can put things in order so that you can receive a revelation. Hopefully, because I can't give revelation. Only the Holy Spirit can give revelation. But if He gives revelation, your life will be changed forever. And church will not be just another thing, just another coming together on Sunday. Church takes on a whole new experience. Because church is not this building. Church is you and how we relate one to another. I want you to turn to your Bibles. We're going we're gonna to do a little bit of a teaching before we get into the ministry time. I want to talk about Jesus, first of all. In Matthew 4, verse 23 and 24, Jesus is going throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And this is what I want you to see. And healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. So I want you to capture this in your mind. Jesus, when he, was, when he was going into the synagogues, it was his normality to do this, is what he did. He would go into the Jewish synagogues and he would teach. But he wouldn't just teach, he would also heal the sick. He would cast out demons and he'd heal the sick. A reason why. There's a reason for that. But I want you to see that every illness, every sickness was healed by Jesus. Jumping now to Matthew 8, 16. And when evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were ill. How many is all? How many percentage of that? How much is uh, in percentage-wise, how much is that? Awe is 100%. Not one person left there without being healed. Not one person. He healed them all. Amen. That is my Jesus. Matthew 12, 15. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him. And he healed them all. Mark 6, there's a, there's a bad concept in Mark 6. Jesus went out from there, and he came into his hometown. Mark 6, 1 through 6. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath come, came, he began teaching in the synagogue. And many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get such things? And what is this wisdom that has been given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Oh, hey, hey, I recognize that guy. I know who that is that's doing all that. That's Jesus. That is the carpenter's son. We know him. We know his brothers, James and, and, and jo Jose and Judas and Simon, and not his sisters are here among us. And they took offense. Look at that. And they took offense. Why did they take offense? I mean, just because they knew him, does that change who he is? But you see, when we know somebody, we have a tendency to, to think that they're not capable of doing that which God has given them to do. 
Many times we get so familiar within a body of Christ in, a, in an assembly that we do not recognize that there are people in that assembly, that very assembly that God has given to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to preach the gospel in the very assembly. We start to relate to people on a very um, low level. We rub shoulders with them and we think, well, they're just like us or or. Who do they think that they are that they would try to heal somebody? And so they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except for in his hometown and among his own relatives in his own house. And he could do no miracles there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Now, here's the, here's the bad conception that we have. We think because of the people's lack of faith, he couldn't do any miracles there. Because of the lack, the offense that they took, the, the, the way that they perceived him, that he couldn't do the miracles. It was like their perception of him kept him from exercising that authority and anointing to heal the sick. But I'll tell you what, that is not what's happening. All these verses prior to this, when these people heard that Jesus was coming to their town, the fame that Jesus had went to the villages that went before him. He, they knew that Jesus was coming. And they, they got excited about Jesus was coming to their, to their sound, town. And what would happen? They would go and they would... They would grab oh God, oh God. They would grab up Aunt Mary and say, Come on, Aunt Mary. Hey, come on. Aunt Mary, come, come. Listen, I know that you're sick. I know that you, but Jesus is coming to our town. Jesus is coming. You're going to meet him. He's healing everybody, everybody. <laughs> Don't stay home. If you stay home, you're not going to get healed. Aunt Mary, you got to come. <laughs> Uncle Joseph. Come on, I know you're limping, but come on, help me, I'll help you. Come on, where are you going, Mary? <laughs> if you stay home, you're not going to experience Christ. You're not going to experience, don't stay home. Don't stay home. Don't stay home. And they were busy drawing people out of the homes. So that he could heal them all. All. But when they recognized him, oh, he's the carpenter's son. Oh, sorry, uncle. It's just that Jesus. Uh, sorry to get you so excited, but we know him. He's just the carpenter's son. Oh, Aunt Mary. Uh, it was a false alarm. I mean, this guy... We know, we know his sisters. We know his brothers. It, it, it just... We know him. He's like one of us. Why bother pulling everybody out to be healed? And so Jesus still had the power to, to heal. He was still anointed to heal. But the people didn't respond to bring to him those that were sick, that was needing healing. I find it very peculiar that I find such expectation upon the people that were to be healed. Remember the lady that was sick? Issue of blood. I mean, she, now listen, guys. We read these stories and we don't understand. This woman, she bled from her womb for 12 years. Non-stop bleeding. Can you imagine that? Non-stop bleeding. She spent, the Bible says, she spent all of her money. On doctors and she was no better now you would think that the woman would have this concept of no hope 
I've gone to every doctor in town. I've gone to every doctor in the state. I've spent all my money, and I'm still bleeding. And every day as she bled, if you've ever bled before, you know that has an effect on your strength of your body. For 12 years, this woman has been bleeding. She is not a very strong person. But she hears one day, Jesus is coming. She not only knew that who Jesus was, but she also knew of the word of testimony about what he was doing in all these surrounding areas. And so she, she convinced herself, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. Punto. I'm oh, sorry. That was Spanish. You guys. Exclamation mark, okay? I will be healed. Exclamation mark. If I can just touch the. But there was a problem. Because Jesus had a lot of fame. Have you ever gone to a rock? I haven't, but have you? Gone to a rock uh, concert where there's somebody famous there? Or maybe, maybe to somewhere else that there's a, uh, somebody famous? George Bush? Or I use George Bush because he's around here, right? Trump rally. Trump rally. A Trump rally. You want to go see Mr. Trump. And there's a horde of people around him. And you want his autograph on your, on your Make America Great hat, right? And you got all this secret service. You have all these people around him. I need some help. First of all, I need a Jesus. Ed, you're my Jesus. Now, I need a multitude. How, some of you guys back on the back there that, that are not in pain, come on up here and help me. About 10 people, please. Come on, come on. You want out of here on time, you're going to have to move. Come on. Now, now let, me, let, me, let, me, let me fix this, 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 this story now. Somebody has just come to Jesus and says, Hey, we need you to come to this house because there's, a, there's somebody that's sick. We need you to come. Jairus' daughter is sick. We need you to heal this, this, this person because this person has been good to us, and, and you need to do a favor for him. And so Jesus decided, okay, I will go. Now, it says that it was a multitude of people. When we're talking about multitude of people, we're not talking about 10 people. We're not talking about 20 people. We're talking about, in the book of John, it was talking about thousands of people. Jesus had to feed 5,000 men, let alone the women and the children. So when we're talking about multitude, we're talking about a large group of people around Jesus. They walked with Jesus. They wanted to see what Jesus was doing. And as he walked, they the Bible says in the story, they pressed hard against him. Press hard against him. Come on, guys. Press. He's trying to make his way, but they're pressing hard. Why? That, you know, he was so famous. Now, now, hey, now, now, now. Keep going. Keep doing it. Now, this woman. Watch me. Watch me. Watch me. This woman says, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. But she has a, a lot of stacking, right? She has a lot of people that's, that is against her. I mean, she's weak, right? But now she has to find her way and get between people. Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, please let me through. Oh, no. Get out of here. Get, oh, I need it. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Not everybody's in your favor. And she has to make the effort. If you don't make an effort, guess what? You're going to be sitting on the side of the road, and you're going to say, well, that didn't work out very well, did it? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? There's got to be an expectation. You've got to have an expectation of what Christ is going to do. If you're not convinced that God is the healer through Jesus Christ, then guess what? You're not going to be healed. But if you can realize, you can have that concept that Jesus heals today. Oh, buddy. 
So she makes her way. Come on, come on. I got to get, I got, I got to, I got to, oh, I got to touch. What happened? What happened? When she touched the cloth, Jesus, Jesus, he says, Whoa! Wow! Somebody touched me. And the guy's around him says, Oh, well, yeah. I mean, we've been touching you all day. But what was the difference? She touched the hem of his garment with that expectation of a healing. And through her expectation, through her faith, it actually pulled, pulled healing power from Jesus. And he felt it. Power came out. And he felt it. And he looked around the crowd, and that woman was up back there, and she says, it was me. And she said, come here. Come here. Your faith has healed you. Amen. <laughs> Understand what I'm saying? Your faith has healed you. Jesus is always powerful to heal. Always. And sometimes we have to make the effort to touch, to heal. Thank you guys. You did a good job, dude. Good job. Well, that's all good. Because we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about we're talking about the God that was creator, that disrobed himself of all of his glory. We're talking about he who came down among his created things to become a creature created. We see a, 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 a divine, a divinity becoming man, and he was a hundred percent man. I want to tell you this. When he was born of the woman, he was born 100% man. He was raised as a man in a family. When he was 30 years old, he entered the water to be water baptized by John the Baptist. And while he was in the water, being water baptized, the Holy Spirit came and rested upon him and maintained that presence upon him. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was a man. Now, hear me. Hear me. I don't want you to think otherwise. He was a man, just like you, just like me, full of the Holy Spirit. If you have any other concept, well, he did all those things because he was God. No. He was he was God, but he came as man. In the, in the very essence, as a baby, being born of a man so that he could clothe himself, not with glory, but with humanity. So that he could walk before us, showing us a purpose and showing us a way. Because if he was doing these things because he was God, then we don't have a chance. There is no way that we can duplicate him in his life if we maintain the concept that he was God, and that's why he could do that. But if we can realize that he was a man, just like you and I, full of the Holy Spirit, then it comes to the point of, I am a man, and I am full of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the same Spirit that was in Christ Jesus resides within me. And that changes the whole aspect of things. Jesus then told us in Mark 16, 15, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. When I look at that, I have to realize, how did he go and preach the gospel? He preached the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit, healing the sick, casting out the devils. And then he would bring forth the kingdom of God. 
the preaching of the kingdom of God after the people received the teaching. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 16. First of all, before I get into this, I want to ask a question. How many believers do I have here today? Hallelujah. Are you a believer? Why don't you stand to your feet, all you believers? Do you believe? All right. Now I'll turn to Mark 16, 16. 16, 16. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. And he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Verse 17. And these signs will accompany those who have believed. Hello. Hello. Now you're standing on your feet today. You're saying, I believe, I believe, I believe. Now you can sit down. I don't want to make it too strong. I am a believer in Jesus. Oh, yeah? You say that you're a believer, but let's, let's, let's get this right. Now, these are the words of Jesus. This is not my opinion. Jesus says, if you are a believer in my name, you're going to have certain signs that will follow you. Or in other words, as you walk in life, behind you is going to be a trail of signs that's going to accompany you, or you're going to leave a testimony of your life as you proceed in living. Understand? Jesus is saying there is a proof in the pudding if you are a believer. Okay, let's look at these. In my name, in my name, if you're a believer, number one, in my name, you will. This is not optional. It doesn't say you might. It says you will. You will cast out demons. What was the last demon you cast out? Well... Two things. If you haven't cast out a demon, one, maybe you've been walking in ignorance. Okay, ignorance to the fact that you should be casting out demons. Or two, it hasn't presented itself yet. Okay? But the position that Jesus took is if you're a believer, there's a faith that you're going to have. And that faith is going to have faith in my name. In my name, you will cast out demons. All right, so there's a faith element there. Faith in the name. Faith in who Jesus is. But a faith to step out. Hear me? A lot of people have this head knowledge. Well, yeah, I know. That, I know. I know that there was a Christ. I know that he lived 2,000 years ago. I know that he died. He was crucified. I know that he says that Jesus raised him or that God raised him from the dead. I know that in the head knowledge. But it's not experimental. It's not something of their interior being that causes them to have a conviction. A conviction knowing that he is the living, resurrected Christ. And everything that I am and everything that I do is because he is the resurrected Christ. I cannot cast out a demon on my own. It requires authority. And that authority I can only obtain through Jesus Christ. He has all authority. All authority has been given to him. And therefore, in his name I stand and I cast out a demon. But I have to have faith to believe that. Number two, what does it say? They will speak. With new tongues. I used to think that was optional. I don't think that anymore. 
I truly believe that every single man, woman, and child that is a true believer of Jesus Christ shall be full of the Holy Spirit. They need to be full of the Holy Spirit. They need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that has now been sent to dwell in us and to draw us near to Christ and to display His power. If I do not have the indwelling of the Spirit of God within me, then how? How can it happen? I will if I'm a believer. If I'm a, Jesus' words, don't throw rocks at me. Jesus says, if you believe, you will speak in new tongues. The last two weeks in our trip to Mexico, everybody wanted to invite us to eat. <laughs> you see, it's not all my fault, even though I do like to eat. And every place we went to eat, I would ask the host, hostess, are you full of the Holy Spirit? You speak in tongues? Why do I say that? Why? Because I want to make sure that they're a true believer. According to Jesus, these signs will follow the true believer. So if they are not full of the Holy Spirit, they're not speaking in tongues, we have a situation we have to remedy. And I had seven people in that last two weeks, seven people that says, no, I don't, I don't speak in tongues. I, I think I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I, I don't speak in tongues. Well, the Bible says, he who believes shall speak in new tongues. So we, take, we took the afternoon or the morning, and we would sit down with these couples, and we would progress them through the scriptures, but then came time to ministry. And every single one of the seven spoke in tongues. Every single one of them. If you are not full of the Holy Spirit, you're not speaking in tongues, invite us out for lunch. God has got a plan for your life. You've all heard that, right? God's got a plan for your life. Right? You all hear that? We know that. From the foundations of the world, God has prepared works for you to do. Let me tell you something. When God says, I have prepared these works for you to do, He is not giving you those works apart from the indwelling Christ. The only way that you're going to do those works that you've been predetermined, predestined to do is that you are full of His Spirit. If you are not full of His Spirit, I've got, I've got news for you. You will not have the power, nor will you have the ambition or the faith to do the works that God's got you to do. But if you are full of the Spirit, then your life is no longer yours, and the Holy Spirit is within you, and He's determining your path. Amen? Therefore, He is directing your feet to accomplish those works that He will enable you to do. Apart from Him, you cannot do anything. But with Him, all those glorious works will be done. I don't care your age. I don't care your... your, your uh, if you're male, female, or transgender, or whatever it is, God, you didn't get that. You didn't laugh at that. I thought this was Trump territory around here. Anyway, it doesn't make any difference if you're male or female. It doesn't make any difference if you're old or young. You will accomplish these things. We had a 72-year-old woman came with us to Thailand, 72. She couldn't hardly walk. Everywhere she went, I had to always be at her side to help her along, but she was fulfilling a dream that God had put into her heart about going to the nations, about teaching children, 72 years old. 
I don't care how old you. We knew a lady, 80, 83 years old. She had stage four, stage four cancer of the lungs. And she was on the mission field preaching. She died about two years ago preaching the gospel. 80 some years old. Fulfilling the purposes of God in her life. I don't care what your background is. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what kind of condition you are in. I know that God has got a plan for your life. And it will not happen unless you are full of His Spirit. It has to happen. Let's continue. Verse 18. And, they will, and we're still talking about these signs that are falling. We're talking about faith. Faith is required to cast out a demon. Faith is required to speak in tongues. Faith is required that if you pick up a snake and the thing bites you, Faith is going to be needed so that you will know that you're not going to die. Or if you drink any deadly thing, any deadly poison, you will not be harmed by it. Now think about this. Paul, shipwrecked, cold, rainy. He goes and he picks up some wood to go put on the fire, on the bonfire. And out of the wood comes a snake, a a snake that everybody on the island knew was poisonous. And it laid hold of him. He it bit him on the hand. But because God had, or because Paul knew his God, and because he had faith in Christ Jesus, he went over to the bonfire with that snake hanging from his hand. Can you imagine that? And all these islanders are looking at him. Oh, he's surely going to die. He's surely going to die. Look at that snake. We know that snake. That's a, that's a, A rattlesnake. I mean, look at that. That is a rattlesnake attached to his hand. He, I guess he was a murderer. He thought he was going to escape justice. But God has just got him. And they see him walk over to the fire. And he shakes the thing off into the fire. And nothing happens to him. And guess what? What happened to that island? Because they saw that snake hanging off of his hand, and nothing happened to him. What happened to that island? They were evangelized because of a miracle, because Paul could stand in this, in this position. I am a believer. I don't go looking for rattlesnakes, but by golly, if one bites me, I'm going to have the faith to know that I can trust my God in all things. Understand what I'm saying? And then it goes on to say, and they will lay their hands on the sick people. Every believer, every single believer, this is not just for the evangelists. This is not just for Randy. This is not just for the elders. This is for every single person that says, I am a believer. And because I am a believer... I will lay my hands on the sick. It's one thing. It's one thing to lay your hands. That's one thing. That is an act of faith. Amen? But the other part of that says, and they will recover. No doubt. Understand what I'm saying? If you're a believer, you will lay your hands on the sick. When was the last time you did that? I can't do that. I don't have that. I don't have the gift of healing. I'm not talking about the gift of healing. I'm talking about you as a believer. I'm talking about an inheritance that you have as a believer. And I'm going to be showing that in just a few minutes. I haven't heard from the Holy Spirit today. I have not heard, oh, I want you to go heal this man. I haven't heard that. The only thing I know is that what I'm going to be presenting to you this week is the gospel. The new covenant gospel. And you've got to know, you've got to know that Jesus Christ is real. 
You've got to know that he's more than just a, 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 a name on a page or somebody that you pray to. You've got to know that he's real and that he's a resurrected Christ. You've got to know that. You've got to know that he is, that he cannot lie, that he is faithful, that he does not change. And when he thinks about you, he thinks good thoughts. He's for you, not against you. He didn't give you that sickness. He wants you healed just as he sent his son to heal. He has sent us to heal. Let's continue. Oh, well, you say, well, that's good for Jesus. And yeah, now we're starting to understand it's for the believer. But what? Okay, give me an example. All right. Acts chapter 2. Jesus has gone up to heaven. And he's just left his church in charge. He's given the church. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I haven't got there yet. Let's go to John. Sorry, I had a wrong scripture here. John chapter 14, verse 12. John 14, verse 12. If you've got this in your Bible, underline it. If you haven't under, underlined it yet. John chapter 14, verse 12. Truly. Truly. Now that's how, that's how Jesus starts this. Truly, truly. What's he doing? He's saying, of a truth, of a truth. Twice he repeats it. Anytime you see in the Bible, truly, truly, or something repeated two times, know that the thing will surely come to pass. Paul said, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing shall be established. And so Jesus, when he's bringing this about, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, without a mistake, this will surely take place. The works that I do, Jesus said, what, what kind of works did he do? Name me some. Come on, congregation, name me some. He healed the sick. What else? Raised the dead. What else did he do? Changed the water to wine. What else? He, he healed the blind eyes. What else? He crippled men, the lepers. He walked on water. And Jesus saying, truly, truly I say to you, to you, the works that you see me do, The works that you see me do, these same works you will do. You are to do the same works. <laughs> that's, that's pretty strong, right? There's a little comma right there after those words, a little comma, and he continues. It doesn't get any better, guys. It, 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 it gets really tough. And the works that I do, he will do also. And, and he who believes in me. <sighs> believers, 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 believers. Hello. You all show me today. You're standing up. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Okay. He says, and those who believe in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And... Greater works. Greater works. Greater works. Greater works. Greater works. Greater works you will do. Greater works you will do. Why? Because I go to the Father. What does that mean that he goes to the Father? 
What is he trying to tell us? Because I go to the Father, greater works than what I've done, you will do. Greater works. Why does he say, because I go to the Father? John 16, 7, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I do not, if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, somebody read that because I have my, my PowerPoint's all mixed up here. John 16, verse 7. It is actually best for you that I go away because if I don't, the counselor won't come. If I do go away, he will come because I will send him to you. Mm -hmm. Because I go, I will send the counselor. I will send the helper. Is he floating around, this helper? Is he a force that we reckon with? What is this? He is the spirit of the Christ that dwells in us. In us. Therefore, when we walk, guys, when we walk, I've heard pastors say, well, I hope that the Spirit of God descends upon us today. Well, no, there's no descending upon us. It is a raising up of the acknowledgement that He is, and you release Him to do what He needs to do. What time is it? I'm over. Verse 7, 38, he who believes in me, Scripture says, from the innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Speaking of the Holy Spirit. But he spoke this of the Spirit, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Acts chapter 5, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly adding to their number to such an extent that they even carried the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets that when Peter, when he came by, that his shadow might fall on them and heal them. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus healed no one by his shadow falling upon somebody. No account of that at all. But now, in the New Testament, after the Holy Spirit is given, Peter walks down the street, and all the, all the sick people are lined up along this, the, the side of the road. And his shadow, as he passed by, they got healed. Greater works than I do, you shall do. Also, the people from the, the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick and afflicted with unclean spirits. And what does it say? And they all were healed. Jesus healed all, and now his disciples are healing all. Well, you see, guys, this can be just theory. This, this can be just had knowledge, unless it's demonstrated. The power of God has got to be demonstrated. As a matter of fact, let's go there. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter two. Verse 2, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you with weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in a demonstration, in a demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that, now catch this, 
so that your faith would not rest upon the wisdom of men. but on the power of God. So that your faith might rest, might be sustained by, not by a lot of teaching with eloquent words, but with a demonstration of power. 